So we heard that you like RGB lighting. Wait, uh, actually, let me rephrase. We heard you love a ton of RGB lighting. Well, at least that's what Palette thinks. Introducing the GameRock OC Midnight Kaleidoscope. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are back with our second RTX 4090 AIB card review. This time we're looking at Palette's RTX 4090 GameRock OC Midnight Kaleidoscope. Featuring a bling-tastic design, this card also comes with dual BIOS support, there's a 90MHz factory overclock and a triple slot, triple fan cooler. So hopefully it will deliver in terms of performance alongside the alluring aesthetic. Just quickly then in terms of pricing on this graphics card, obviously all the stock did sell out on day one. We are hearing though that there is expected to be good supply over the next three to four weeks. That does just make it a little bit tricky to say exactly where this card will end up in terms of its pricing positioning. A quick look using PC Part Picker shows us that on launch day, it was selling at just over £1,900 on Overclockers UK. So it's certainly not going to be, you know, close to MSRP or an MSRP card. But then again, I wouldn't expect it to be as pricey as something like the ROG Strix. Kicking off this review, though, with a look at the design of the card. At first impressions, it may look similar to the GameRock cards from the RTX 30 series. But Palette has changed a few things and gone for a darker overall tone, hence the name Midnight Kaleidoscope. We can see a black plastic shroud, but with some brushed metal plates that definitely do add a premium feel in the hand. While the plastic RGB diffusers, which Palette calls the crystals, they are now a much darker shade as well until they are turned on at least. We may as well dive straight into the RGB lighting now then as there really is no missing it. I personally do actually quite like it but obviously I really do expect this to split opinion heavily. The one thing I would say though in terms of the RGB is that I really do think you need to be vertically mounting this card to get the best from the RGB and to get the best look at the lighting itself. That for me maybe isn't the best idea considering how high power a 4090 is and especially one this thick it's likely to be sitting pretty close to your case's side panel so it could well be choking the airflow somewhat. You can still see a good amount of the RGB lighting though with the card mounted horizontally and Palette also includes this little cable to allow you to sync the ARGB lighting up with your motherboard. The header for this cable though is smack bang right in the middle of the graphics card, actually next to the power connector. So for me that's not really the ideal positioning as it could make cable management a little bit tricky. So I would have preferred to see this at the end of the card. Moving on though to talk about the dimensions of this graphics card as we would expect for basically any 4090. It is pretty large. It measures in at 329 by 137.5 by 71.5 millimeters, so it's actually three and a half slots thick. Touching quickly on the three fans as well, these measure 90 millimeters across, so they're not the largest fans we've seen on an RTX 4090, but they're still a decent size. Palette calls this design the Gale Hunter fan, and they have a new winglet fan tail on the edge of the fan blades, and Palette claims this should improve overall airflow concentration. Flipping the card over then, we can also take a look at the full length metal backplate again in this sort of grey to dark grey colour. We can also note plenty of cutouts towards the end of the card to allow airflow to pass directly through the heatsink. Back towards the IO bracket though is where we get a look at the dual BIOS switch. So by default the card uses the performance BIOS and this has a higher fan speed, power limit and out of the box clock speed compared to the silent BIOS, but of course we will be testing both modes later on in this review. Speaking of power as well, of course the new 12VH PWR connector is used, though Palette does include a 4 8-pin power adapter. Out of the box power is still set at 450 watts, though this can be raised to 500 watts 
while overclocking. We can also note standard display outputs as well with three DisplayPort 1.4 and one HDMI 2.1. Removing the cooler now to take a look at the PCB, we can see that Pallet has opted for a 16 phase VRM for the GPU and a three phase VRM for the memory using 50 amp on semi NCP 302150 MOSFETs. UPI UP9512 controllers are used as well. We can also take a look at the 12 GDDR6X memory modules manufactured by Micron, and there's also, of course, the AD102 GPU taking pride of place, and that measures 608 square millimeters. As for the cooler, Pallet is another company to use a vapor chamber, this time with a copper base that contacts both the GPU die and the memory. The vapor chamber sits on top of eight heat pipes, four six millimeters and four eight millimeters thick, utilizing a hefty fin stack for heat dispersal. An additional cold plate is also mounted onto the fin stack that contacts with the VRM. We can, however, see that Pallet didn't add any thermal pads to the back plate, which isn't a massive deal, but I figure if you're putting a metal back plate, you may as well add the thermal pads just to help draw a bit of heat out and acts like a heat spreader. That's gonna do it then for our look at the design of the card, and now let's move on to testing. For this, we are of course using our regular GPU test system, which is powered by MSI. This packs in Intel's i9-12900K CPU, paired with the MSI Meg Z690 Unifier motherboard, and we also have 32 gigabytes of a Data XPG Lancer DDR5 memory clocked at 6,000 megahertz. All testing was also done using the MSI MPG321 URQD 4K monitor. Kicking off our testing then with the out of the box thermal performance, here we tested both the silent and the performance BIOS. There's not actually a lot of difference between the two modes though, with the performance BIOS hitting 65.3 degrees on the CPU compared to 66.7 degrees for the silent BIOS, and there was only a one degree difference in hotspot temperatures as well. Likewise, for the memory temperatures, the performance BIOS saw a peak of 72 degrees, with the silent BIOS running two degrees warmer. Both are still very solid results, just not quite as good as the Inno 3D X3OC. We also noted just a one decibel difference in the total noise output, with the silent BIOS at 37 dB compared to 38 dB for the performance BIOS. It turns out the reason for that is because the fans only run 85 RPM faster using the performance BIOS, where they hit 1520 RPM compared to 1435 RPM using the silent mode. Still on the topic of noise, I also noticed just a little bit of a buzzing or whining sound coming from the fans when spinning at their default speeds. To be clear, this was not coil whine as the kind of buzzing noise stopped when the fan stopped, but take a listen for yourself. The good news is that I didn't actually notice this when the system fans were running as normal because I had them stopped for that sound test you just heard. So I definitely wouldn't say this was a big problem, but maybe if you have your case fan tuned to a super low speed, this may be something that you notice. For noise normalized thermals then, we increased the fan speed up to 1780 RPM where it hit 40 decibels. That actually resulted in the best GPU thermals we've seen yet, with the GPU at 61.8 degrees and the hotspot at 69.5 degrees. So it's running about two degrees cooler than the Inno 3D X3OC when noise normalized. Memory thermals also hit 68 degrees, so that's another two degree reduction compared to the Inno 3D. As for power draw then, considering that the Palette card comes with a four eight pin adapter, I wasn't able to use Nvidia PCAT to get power draw of just the graphics card, but we did measure total system power draw. And considering the card has a 450 watt power limit out of the box, just like the other two cards I've already tested, power draw was right in line, coming in at just over 650 watts. Moving on then to clock speed behavior. Now here's actually where I noticed just a little bit 
of an oddity. The GameRock OC has the highest rated boost clock of any RTX 4090 I've tested so far, but for some reason it wouldn't boost as high as the Inno 3D X3 OC in Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, which is what I use to run my 30 minute GPU stress test and log the average frequency from that data. This is just a bit strange because the GameRock OC actually recorded higher frame rates than the Inno 3D in every other game we tested apart from Metro Exodus. So if I had to give a reason for this behavior, I think it's just a case of the clock speed varying depending on the workload as Metro Enhanced Edition is particularly heavy on the ray tracing. If we look at clock speed in Cyberpunk 2077 with no ray tracing, we can actually see the GameRock OC produced a higher operating clock speed, which is more in line with what we'd expect. This certainly isn't a big deal either way though, as overall performance is still incredibly similar between the two cards, but it was just something I noticed, so I would thought I would share. With that said then, I will roll the game benchmarks and you can see for yourselves just how little difference the factory overclock actually makes. Performance was only 2% better than the Nvidia Founders Edition at most, so we're talking a maximum of a 3-4 to four FPS difference. It really is nothing you notice when actually playing these games in the real world and that's why we just don't focus too much on game testing for our AIB reviews. Instead, we take a closer look at thermals and noise levels. Overclocking is a focus as well, with the Palette GameRock OC able to increase the power limit up to 500 watts. That's still not as far as something like the Founders Edition, which can go up to 600 watts, but we were still able to add 205 megahertz to the GPU and 1300 megahertz to the GDDR6X memory. That resulted in a slightly lower average clock speed compared to the Founders Edition, but it was still operating at over 2.9 gigahertz, plus the memory was actually running faster when overclocked compared to the Founders card. As a result, we saw gains of between 6 to 7% in the titles that I retested, and that is decent but nothing mind-blowing, though that does appear to be the trend for the 4090, based on the three cards that I've tested so far. Overall then, the Palette RTX 4090 GameRock OC Midnight Kaleidoscope is another impressive RTX 4090 AIB card. This one actually offers the best noise normalized thermal performance that we've seen so far, though do remember that I've only tested one other custom card, but it still leaves the palette in a very good spot. As good as the cooler is though, I can't help but feel it actually takes a back seat to the overall design and the sheer RGB on this graphics card, which is probably the reason you're watching this video. It is just incredibly eye-catching, though at the same time, it's also likely to split opinion like nothing else. I do just have a couple of complaints about the RGB though, the first being that if you don't vertically mount it, I don't think you're getting the most from the overall aesthetic and vertically mounting a 4090 this thick definitely has some thermal implications. Additionally, the ARGB cable is in a very awkward spot and can make cable management a bit clunky, so I would have preferred to see this on the end of the card. Still, that and just the very slight buzzing I heard from the fans are really my only complaints about the GameRock OC, so overall it has definitely impressed me. If you like the design, it has a number of good features including the dual BIOS, the factory overclock and the impressive cooler. So if you are in the market for a 4090, this is definitely one to add to your shortlist. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this review. If you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up and as always, let me know your thoughts on this card and the blingtastic design down in the comments. While you're there, please do subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell. And why not come chat with us on our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While you're down there, you can also find a link to our merch store. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you can even back us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Forkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.